and on behalf of all of us at Lift Ireland, an incredibly warm welcome to everybody who's here on this call today. My name is Joanne Hessian. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Lift Ireland, and we're delighted to have you here. This event is being streamed on YouTube and Facebook, and it will be available for replay afterwards. Thank you so much for taking an hour to join us as we look at what is meant in 2021 by good leadership in politics in Ireland and internationally. Many of you were with us at our last event. It was the first of the Better Leadership Forum about leadership in the media. It was on last month. One of the contributors, to, contributors at that event was Emily O'Reilly. And one of the things that she said that really struck me at the time was how she recalled Garrett Fitzgerald once saying that politics was the most ethically challenging of all professions. That really struck me, and if that's true, I find it really concerning that one of the most important of all of the roles in our society is also the one where it's most difficult to do the right thing. So why should that be? Is it down to the political system that we've inherited? Is it down to the individual ambition and hunger for power? Is it down to the intense complexity and busyness of modern life? Is it possible to exercise good and positive leadership in politics? And what would that look like? We have an incredible panel to discuss these issues today and to talk to us over the next hour about what they see as the key to good leadership in politics. I'm really looking forward to hearing the contributions. And with that, let me pass over to you to our fantastic moderator for today, journalist, broadcaster and author, Alison O'Connor. Alison, over to you. Thanks a million, Joanne. Uh, I really am delighted to be here today to chair this um, this leadership event. And I guess it's always a good time to discuss political leadership. Um, and for someone like myself who's been covering politics for, for decades now, the older I've gotten and the more I've seen, uh, I'm interested, of course, in political leadership and even over a year, like we've just had a year and a bit, but I'm particularly interested in more female leadership and female representation in politics. I can see how debates change, political debates change, and how context can be altered when you have a better gender balance, more women in the room, and women sharing that leadership. Uh, and I think a recent example of that would be the pandemic, where you had really, at the very top echelons of the decision making, you didn't have um, you didn't have females there with the power to make to make the decisions. And when we look back on this time, I think we might reflect on how some things might have uh, might have happened differently. So, look, we have a limited amount of time today, so I'm not going to take it up. We have some really interesting people, um, you know, who are going who are going to speak. And um, the first of those, uh, I'm going to introduce you to the lineup now, uh, is uh, Alva Smith. Alva is an academic and one of the country's best known social campaigners. Most recently, Alva was co-leader of the Together for Yes uh, referendum campaign. I suppose I should declare a, a, an interest here or a conflict in that I, I, wrote, I wrote a book on that. Um, Alva Enright is a solicitor and was the first female TD to represent Leash Offley. She has worked in public affairs and is currently an advocacy consultant with DOCUS. Last, but by no means least, um, of our Irish representation, we have Deputy Jim O'Callaghan. Jim is a barrister and Fianna Fáil TD for Dublin Bay South. And rather excitingly, we'll also be joined by Congresswoman Mickey Sherrill, who was elected to the US House of Representatives in 2018, serving New Jersey's 11th Congressional District. Mickey spent almost 10 years on active duty with the United States Navy. We're also joined today by Neve Brennan. Neve is the, the Michael McCormick Professor of Management at University College Dublin, a woman who frequently shows leadership when it comes to the importance of good corporate governance in Ireland. Neve is conference rapporteur for the Better Leadership Forum. Now, we would like as much audience participation as we can get today. Um, so please, if you're interested in asking a question or leaving a comment, can you post those uh, for the panel through the chat function on YouTube or Facebook? And if you use the hashtag Better Leadership Forum, that's Better Leadership Forum. So we will get to the audience questions as the session progresses. And in the meantime, just a reminder to you all, if you could keep your microphones on mute while the panel discussion is underway, so I'm going to start with you, Jim, if I may, and I'm hoping that you can give us a brief overview of your thoughts on, on the topic. How do you cultivate good political leaders? Yeah, thanks very much, Alison. And the first thing I want to do is I want to thank Lyft for organizing this event and for inviting me to speak at it. 
And can I say at the outset, I'm slightly wary that I've been asked to speak about good political leadership. Uh, the reason I say that is because I know that as a politician, that politics and political leadership is not easy. But talking about it uh, can be quite easy. I just think we don't have enough recognition uh, in Ireland, and maybe it's the case internationally as well, but politics itself uh, is very hard. I've worked in other fields, as you've said. Uh, my own assessment is politics is the hardest field I've worked in. I think that's the case for two reasons. First of all, in Ireland anyway, it's extremely hard to get elected, and sometimes the public aren't aware of that. You know, some people can be lucky, they can ride the crest of a wave and get elected in one election, but to get elected and to remain elected in Ireland is difficult. Second, because politics is about uh, political choices and it's about limited resources, it inevitably becomes seen and is presented in, in simple terms. Political outcomes are seen as being easily achievable. And I suppose part of the reason for that is because politicians spend a lot of time portraying political choices as being easy and they portray their opponents as being inept or sometimes even worse. And so that's probably natural because of the adversarial system we have. But in the long term, that's damaging to the political system mm -hmm. as it seeks to portray what is a very complicated issue, namely politics, as being a very simple issue. And I think we all need to recognize that when it comes to leadership, we need to recognize the complexity of the issues or the institutions that we're trying to lead. I'm conscious I only have five minutes. So what I've done is I'm going to try and give you what I view as being five sure. characteristics of a good political leadership. And the first thing I would say for any political leader is that I think it's extremely important that a leader needs to know what he or she wants to achieve. You know, it helps if you have a very clearly defined political objective. Sometimes, of course, that can be outside your control. Alison mentioned the pandemic, like who's to know as a political leader how they were going to be responding to a pandemic since it wasn't something that was on people's uh, perspective or radar 18 months ago. But that means, I suppose, events can define your leadership. But it's really important as a leader that you try to define and describe to the public what you want to achieve. And if you tell the public what you want to achieve, they'll place your political leadership in the context that you as a politician have chosen. And if you don't, I suppose you're going to be completely dependent on events and reacting to them. Second point I'd make is I think a political leader needs to have a long term view. And sometimes that can be difficult because of the proximity of the next election. But I think if a leader wants to achieve and it can be set out what they want to achieve, that the public will be receptive of that, even if it's not attained during their term of leadership. A leader will get the benefit from the public of a long term view uh, if he or she can put in place structures to achieve something, even if that will not materialize during their term of office. The third point I would make is that a leader must try not to become a reactive politician. And that can very easily happen. I suppose when you look at the multitude of issues that are in the political domain every day, it means that a leader can very quickly become a reactive politician. And the downside of that is that the agenda is then dictated and driven by the media or those who gain access to the advocacy of the media. And obviously, the media play a very important role. But I just think as a politician, you do not want to find yourself dependent upon and reliant upon just being a responder to the latest uh, media issue. And the fourth characteristic that I think a national le political leader should try to retain is that you must retain a national perspective. Politics in Ireland and around the world has become quite fragmented, you know, with individual political issues being strong motivators for political action. And that is very commendable. But you can't run a country based on a collection of individual issues or campaigns. You need to have a national perspective. And that's why there is a strong benefit to maintaining, in my opinion, the objectives of a center ground uh, national party, parties that make decisions based uh, on specific interests, not of individual groups, but on the general national interest. And listen, the final characteristic I would say about a political leader is that a leader in politics can't be afraid of failure. 
if you're fearful of failure, you won't make any decisions that may not succeed. You know, when you look at most of the transformative events that have taken place in our society, they contain large elements of risk, whether it's the break from the United Kingdom 100 years ago or changing Ireland's economic emphasis away from farming to a knowledge-based economy. So fear of failure limits a leader to very safe, risk-free policies. So they're just my five characteristics of what good leadership is, uh, Alison. But listen, I don't have a monopoly on it. But thanks for listening to me. Jim, can I just ask... Can I just ask you, arising out of what you said, which is very interesting there, and you, you touch on this yourself, that you're, you, for an individual to uh, su- seek to be a good leader and to perhaps follow your, your advice there, what you, you've just set out, but you also mentioned then the, I suppose, being dragged down by your opponents, the opposition, um, making things appear, appear simplistic. It's far easier, I suppose, in theory, isn't it really, than in, than in practice, and particularly with the clientelist nature uh, of, our, of our politics. Yeah, and I'm not criticising people who are in opposition at present. I just think the adversarial system in Irish politics means uh, that necessarily you present your political opponents as uh, choosing wrong, making wrong decisions, making wrong choices. But in terms of the clientelist uh, element of Irish politics, like, that's not all bad as well. Like I think it is good that the Irish public are able to contact their politicians, they're able to be in touch with them, Yesterday evening, I was out on Camden Street with the Taoiseach. You know, we met people from other countries who were astonished that the Irish Prime Minister was out talking to the public. So, like, it is, I think there are benefits to that. But I just think we need to recognise, and politicians need to recognise, that politics is complicated. And I suppose the big differentiation, and having been in opposition, I know being in opposition is considerably easier than being in government. And I suppose that really is only recognised by politicians when they come into government. Yeah, indeed, it's 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 uh, and quite the task to persuade the public of that. And finally, Jim, and then briefly, a related matter, I suppose, it's to do with you're a member of a party uh, subject to the party whip. So how do you how does a TD um, show leadership on particular issues when you you know are to show courage or conviction on something when that that's part of the rules? You do what the party tells you to do. You vote in a particular way. Well, listen, the party whip is there for a reason. If we don't have a party whip, we're going to have much more fragmented uh, politics in Ireland. And if you have fragmented politics in Ireland, you're going to have smaller groups uh, within Dáil Éireann and and outside Dáil Éireann trying to dictate the agenda, as they're perfectly entitled to do. But my own opinion is that there's a strong benefit in having large national parties where the whip does operate and where decisions are made that you may have difficulty with them, you may oppose them, but you recognise that the government that is in place has an objective, which is to try to steer the country in a better direction over a period of time. So I wouldn't be as dismissive of the whip system as you, you, you implied, Alison. And I also think we need to recognise, sometimes we talk about courageous decisions uh, in Ireland. You know, Irish governments in the past have made courageous decisions, which can also be categorised as unpopular decisions. So just because something uh, is unpopular doesn't mean it's not courageous. Indeed. Indeed. And I didn't, I didn't mean to give the I know impression. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. <laughs> uh, if, if, th- Jim, thank you very much for that. It was really interesting. I'm going to turn now to, to Alwyn Enright. And um, Alwyn is very interesting in her own right uh, for being a politician who decided to retire from politics at a time when it was felt that she was at the, the peak of her career. Now, Alwyn, that really was a difficult decision, I've, I've, I've no doubt. And it demonstrates leadership in a, in a different way. Um, you know, I wonder, can you talk to, to us a bit about that? Yeah, um, it's funny because in making that decision and looking back on it now, um, part of what you, you consider is, or what I was conscious of, was the sense that, are you almost letting the side down? Are, are you kind of saying straight out that women can't do it all or can't have it all or whatever? Um, but I suppose at the end of the day, I decided I was making a decision for me, for my family. And that's what choice should be in the end, the actual choice mm. to be able to walk away if, if you want to, or if it's the right thing for you. Um, so, you know, that's how I approached it. Um, I think this conversation is really interesting. There's a lot in what Jim said that 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 I would agree with. And it's funny because talking about women in politics there, a lot of the words I use to describe what's needed in a leader are, are begin with C. Uh, and that's what they talk about, the four C's are the reasons why there isn't women in politics. 
politics. Uh, but one of the interesting things, I think, is the fact that a lot of the traits that you need as a leader are incompatible with each other in a way, or that's the first thing that you would think. Um, and you'll hear a lot of admiration about a politician. Oh, he or she was a real conviction politician. And that's really, it's really important to have very strong beliefs, but it's not enough. You also have to have the ability to compromise. And I think that's what the WIP system is to an extent. Um, you have to have the ability to listen, to understand, and to maybe change your point of view or your perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's a U-turn and that's something that's criticized, but you actually may make that U-turn or make that change for the absolute right reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other point, the word that Jim touched on was courage. And you can say courage or confidence. And by that, I don't mean bravado because there's, a little bit or maybe a little bit too much of that in politics but again it's it's having the courage to consider other viewpoints and to really think about them and to be honest in your own viewpoint but honest in why you're making the decisions and you know decisions aren't easy as jim said but unpopular decisions sometimes have to be taken um and you have to take people with you or try to take people with you but the I think the difficulty is political leadership is often equated with electoral success. You know, largest majority, biggest number of seats, Taoiseach for the longest time, all those kind of things are seen as success. But the question we should be asking is, what was done with that majority or with that term as Taoiseach or with that? Uh, and that shouldn't be just a history question. That should be something we're conscious of all the way through. And the people then who come to my mind as people who maybe totally gambled uh, with electoral success, or maybe the people who achieved the most for the country, people like John Hume, like Seamus Mallon, like David Trimble. Uh, you know, to me, they were great leaders, um, but from a party evaluation perspective, the parties didn't fare very well as a result of it. And I think another maybe, another relevant example would possibly be Eamon Gilmore. Uh, and you can argue the rights and the wrongs of the decisions that he took uh, at his time in government after the crash. But at the end of the day, again, taking those hard decisions cost him and his party very much electorally. Um, but I'm sure they would argue that they were, they were the right decisions. And cultivating it then and trying to help it develop, um, I think is allowing people to speak up within a party or within the political system. That's difficult, I think. Um, it, it's difficult to have everyone heard. There isn't maybe enough respect mm -hmm other people's points of view uh, and I think sometimes and this is maybe something that anyone is involved in party politics I think Alva might even say the same thing it's important to hear the views of the quieter people in the room uh, you know there can be the same people who talk and have the confidence to talk but they're not the they're not the only perspective that's in there at that meeting and if you can draw out the other people in a room you can maybe have a bit more reasonable debate and a bit less polarization and I think the last thing I'd say on, on it is, I think for political leaders, it's important to surround themselves with people who disagree uh, with them and not just sort of people who are prepared to slap them on the back and say every every decision is great. You have to have people who tell you where you're going wrong. Good, yeah, so thank you. Um, oh, there's a, there's a, a lot of really good stuff to uh, unpack there. I know we haven't heard Alva yet, but I'm beginning to think that this, this lineup would make a good, um, weekend away for budding politicians or even ones that are <laughs> ones that are that are already elected a, a, ref, a reflection or a, lear, a learning weekend oh and can i bring you back just a bit to, to your to that decision that you that you took but i'm wondering about do you think things have become easier maybe um, and that uh, or that the system as it exists still ex, you know is exclusionary of certain people are there more people that you would like to see involved in politics that are not in there of course. I mean, the system as we have it isn't diverse. It doesn't represent Irish society as it is today. I think it's very difficult for people from a lot of different backgrounds to get in there. Uh, and I think back to the point Jim said, it's not that easy to get elected. Um, and it takes a long time a lot of the time. You know, I was, I suppose, the child of a politician, but I mean, I... I because of that, I was in politics from a very young age. So you're really putting in the in the hard graft from an earlier yeah. stage, maybe. Um, but I definitely don't think we have enough diversity. I don't think we're, we're representative of, of Ireland as it is today. And I think that is a big challenge. We talk about it in terms of getting more women involved, and that's really, really important. But it's not the only it's not the only thing that's important. You know, it should reflect, and it's improving. I think uh, at local authority level, but I don't think it's across the board. It's a, maybe. It's very easy when you're in there to talk about people like me, um, no matter who we are, but it's it's everybody else we need to have there as well. Yeah. Um, and just the, that issue that Jim raised, Alvin, I'm curious as to your your thoughts on it in terms of, you know, you you have to be brave to be a leader and, you know, set out your vision and then bring it forward. But then you have you have the opposition and you have even particularly you could say at the moment we have it maybe less so than, than other countries um but that 
there's a far more of a willingness not to believe politicians or not to believe the best of politicians. And that really puts a, casts a shadow on the type of leader uh, one can be. Yeah, now, I don't think it's a bad thing for people to question. Uh, you know, I don't think blanket trust across the board is a good thing, and we shouldn't be afraid of people asking why um, or why decisions are taken. So a bit of set, a bit of scepticism, I think, is no harm, but it may be, maybe it's gone a little bit too far. But again, I suppose that's about behaviour. That's about politicians trying to prove themselves, you know, needing to prove themselves, needing to prove um, and to show their integrity. And, and that can be hard in the cut and thrust of political debate. I think that can be really difficult to do. But it's important. Okay, thank you, Alan. Just before I, I, I call Alva in, I'm just going to read, there's a comment here from Jackie Taff. She's saying that just because something isn't popular doesn't mean it's not courageous. I love this because discussing, highlighting this discussion, because highlighting difficult topics is when change can occur. And Jane Shortall says, respect and kindness is often lacking. We've forgotten how to disagree respectfully. Uh, now, the name Sonia Lennon is after that. So I'm, I'm not sure whether it's, it's Sonia who's... Um, Indeed, a key part of this this organisation. Now, Alva Smith is um, our our next speaker. Hello there, Alva. How are you? Uh, Hi. Alva, you've been involved in some of the most high profile mass movements in Irish political life. The marriage I've named just two, Alva. We don't have time for all of them. Marriage equality and the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment. Do you think they were mass movements born out of leadership failings uh, from our national politicians, Alva? Well, let me say, first of all, that, you know, thank you very much to Lyft for organising this and for inviting me. And also to say what a very great pleasure it is to be on a panel talking about politics, where I find myself so far, uh, broadly speaking, in agreement with the previous speakers, with both Jim and, and Alwyn. And I do actually think that these sort of kinds of conversations are part of the work that we need to be doing to encourage people to think of themselves as being um, political. I know I'm not directly answering your question, Alison. I'm not trying to be a politician because actually one of the things that I think is really important before I answer your question is to say that I am not a politician. I am a very political person, but I am not an elected representative. I never have been. And at this stage in my career, I don't think I ever will be. 30 or 40 years ago, I might have wanted to be, but because I was a feminist, a lesbian, pro-choice, um, you know, add a few more things onto that, I was on an absolute hiding to nowhere. And I do want to say that I do think our politics has opened up and that we have more opportunities now in, in ways that I think are very, very, very important for all kinds of people and we need that. Um, but just, uh, and let me say also that following on from that, that I think social movement politics, local politics um, are incredibly important and that many of us and many of us around the country are very, very political and are involved in all kinds of political um, uh, groups and operations, if you like, and doing things which are about power, about challenging it, about shaping it, about reshaping it, about taking it about, you know, whatever, about trying to work with it uh, in ways that are really important and exciting, but that we have this rather narrow view of seeing politics as being about what happens in the Oireachtas and thinking of it in that way. And I think, you know, really for people to feel themselves as political is maybe number one. So your question, oh, repeat your question, please, Alison. The question I really <laughs> relates to possible for the, the for the issues that you were involved in, we'll say abortion for instance, yeah. it being it being born out of out of sort of citizen movements because of failures, failings on the part of the of national politics. Your your views on that? Well yes, yes and no. I mean I think that it, that demonstrates, you know, that very question itself sort of leaves out the fact that in a political system, the elected representatives are not the only people who are pushing and shaping the political agenda. That comes also in a very direct and immediate way, usually through social movement politics from the people. And it happens generally when politicians are not actually fulfilling, meeting, uh, responding to a perceived need that uh, people people express. So, you know, I'm always very, of course, I think that there are failings in our political system. 
Um, but I think that in all our political parties, that there are people who are setting out to to do that thing of responding to people's needs and so on and so forth. In other words, I think what I'm saying is it's a bit too blunt to say, uh, are there failings? Um, the system doesn't respond quickly enough. The system, the political system, mm -hmm. electoral politics, can be extremely nervous and very fearful. And it's really interesting to hear both Jim and Alwyn talking about the importance of being brave, courageous and fundamentally fearless. Because, you know, if we had had political leaders over a period of time, and I'm thinking right across the board, who had been genuinely fearless in relation to women's rights and specifically women's right reproductive rights we would of course have had a very different situation with mm -hmm. regard to abortion in this country some of us would not have had to spend many decades uh, fighting on it we could have gone on and challenged more and other things that need challenging but so Alvin, can, can i ask you related to that you were a keen observer of our citizens assembly system and that is i suppose leadership from citizens it's it's deliberative democracy. Do you think yeah. that those structures are a valid alternative to electoral politics or something that one leads leads on to the other? Some people will say, why do we need a citizens assembly? We have TDs elected to the doll. Well, I might have said that a good many years ago, a few years ago, but then we had the Constitutional Convention for Marriage Equality and we had Citizens Assembly um, for abortion and, and other matters. And we've also just had one on gender, which has come up with very interesting things. So I actually think that the Citizens Assembly format, one way and another, is um, a really important area now within our political system that should be used, and particularly to begin to uh, enable people who are not normally um, involved in or normally silenced by the political system, the opportunity to speak. And I'm absolutely at one with Alwyn there, because I think fundamentally that what we need above all in politics in this country at the moment is a much wider, broader understanding of who can be a politician. And that obviously includes gender. It's about women. It's also about social class. We need more working class people, people with disabilities, mm -hmm. obviously people of colour. We have a really monochrome kind kind of um, politics at present. And that's not serving our democracy and our people um, adequately. And I think we can't really begin to talk about ethics and politics until we say who is able to get represented, who is able to actually move forward into politics. And I think citizens' assemblies, those kinds of forums can open up that sort of space where, you know, you look at the live stream and you think, oh, wow, there's somebody like me there sitting around that table and expressing their views. OK, Alba, thank you. That, yeah, I think that, uh, that uh, sort of encapsulates it well. I'm sort of interested in hearing the way it's being portrayed about bravery and courage uh, and 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 putting yourself out there it, it i suppose it only does that mean alwyn that leadership appeals only to certain people or that you have to really gird your loins to, to to prepare to prepare for it you know and i guess it, that's bearing in mind that there's leadership at different at different levels as as alba has yeah, just I mean, been pointing out at more, at more local level as well yeah, and there's there's politics at all sorts of levels and in every organization as well. So, you know, not party politics, obviously, but uh, I, I think that's very real. Um, I, I think it's, it's to create sort of the culture um, that people can find their way forward. Um, you know, when I was first asked about gender quotas, for example, years ago, I was really did not like the idea. But you realize nothing's going to change unless we make change. Um, and. I, th I think there has to be a way of looking at the system to see well what else can be what else needs to be addressed and at the point about diversity um ethnicity i mean there has to be ways of ensuring that that people from all backgrounds can come forward and that's not easy because you're trying to change a system that has been in place for so long but also that is quite similar to other systems let's be honest about it, it you know it's not like the the irish political system is that is that different um but i do think well, other I'm things sorry, they, I'm, yeah, I'm really sorry to interrupt you there um yeah. having and having asked you the question but i'm just uh, congresswoman Micah sherrill is actually uh, is actually with us now um so hello there congresswoman Cheryl. thank you so much for for joining us this afternoon and welcome oh, thanks so much for having me 
Uh, no problem at all. It's our pleasure. Um, I would like to start by asking you, and it'll be wonderful to get a, you know, an American voice and perspective on this, about the politics in your home country and how, looking at it from the outside in, it seems to have become increasingly polarised in recent years. And what we're wondering is that within that sort of a climate, is it possible to demonstrate real political leadership that appeals to people and it seeks to do good in a non-partisan way? Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I could tell you from the inside it felt different, but unfortunately, I, I think what you're seeing is what we're feeling. Um, the, a great deal of partisanship, a great deal of division right now in our political system. But not only is it possible to demonstrate real leadership right now, it is really necessary. Um, I'll give you an example. There is a woman um, who I work with. She's I, I'm a Democrat. She's a Republican across the aisle. We both serve on the House Armed Services Committee, uh, Representative Liz Cheney, who I, I will tell you, we don't agree on much. Mm -hmm. I'm from um, an East Coast, uh, New Jersey, uh, you know, suburbs of New York City. Um, she is from Wyoming, one of our Western states, uh, more rural, um, more sparsely populated. New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the United States. And so we don't agree on much. In fact, our political philosophies are, are really, really very different. And yet um, she stood up against her party recently to say that the actions of our former president were, were in fact wrong and that those weren't the values we stood for, um, that we needed to address the problems in our nation head on in a thoughtful way. Um, and, and she, she did that. I, I think she's really put, quite frankly, her political future in peril. Um, but mm. I think that kind of leadership resonates, and I think it resonates over time. I think if we're going to build the type of systems and countries that we want to see, we're, we're playing the long game right now. But it goes that goes back to the uh, conversation that we were having just before you joined. I mean, to do what Liz Cheney did and to suffer for that in the way in which she has, no, that it really takes courage or maybe it takes a realization that you're doing yourself an awful lot of damage and going ahead and doing it anyway. It takes a lot of courage. Um, but, you know, I don't think running for political office um, is for the faint of heart. When we run mm. here in the United States, we have to take an oath to the Constitution of the United States that we represent those values. Part of the oath is that we're going to protect the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, so it is not for the faint of heart. And there's really no excuse, I think, not to have courage if you are going to stand up and, and fight for your values and your country and the values of your country and the people of your country. How can I just ask you then, in your, in your job, in your workplace now and within your, 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 the, the chamber where you work, what's the atmosphere like? There, there, the, the, there's such an intense level of division between the, the, the two parties. There really is. Um, is it, it, for those who, who are sort of following um, our economic recovery from the global pandemic, the President Biden right now is working very, very hard to pass an infrastructure bill, which is generally very bipartisan, where roads, bridges, mm -hmm. tunnels, but mm -hmm. we've really underinvested in the infrastructure of the United States for many, many years. Um, those of your listeners who've been to the United States in recent years might be surprised, quite frankly, uh, if they've ridden the New York subway system or taken the Amtrak train, um, that how behind it feels right now on some of those platforms. And so we really need to invest in that generally bipartisan. And the, the current president has been reaching out to form those bipartisan ties. But even on something like infrastructure and investments in infrastructure to recover from this pandemic, it's become quite partisan. It doesn't actually look, mm. as I sit here right now, like we may be able to move forward in a bipartisan way. Um, so it's there's a lot of division, but there's also a lot of hope. Um, we are moving forward to address and attack issues that have long been systemic problems in our country. Uh, mm. Many of us have, have talked for years about the problems in healthcare um, and infrastructure and issues of the disparities in wealth here. And yet the pandemic has really brought that to the fore. Indeed. May I ask you then, I mean, if you were to give your top two things on what can be done uh, to to restore that maybe faith that has been lost maybe in, in U.S. political leaders, how, how to restore that? I mean, you've mentioned the investment there. Um, 
you know, how else, if you, if you were put in charge of that project, what, what would be the first two things you'd do? If I could wave a magic wand right now, I think what mm -hmm. I would really address is some of how we campaign here, quite frankly. Um, it has become, you know, a, a congressional cycle that I serve in the House of Representatives, the lower house. That is a two year post, really. So it has turned into a constant campaigning mm -hmm. and I'm already seeing attacks um, just nationwide attacks by Republicans against uh, Democrats. We know that the, the minority leader of the Senate said under Obama, his number one um, position, his number one plan was to make sure Obama was a one term president. Those types of, of focus on simply pure politics, pure power politics, always campaigning, as opposed to how we legislate, how we come together, what's really for the good of the nation, I think has poisoned the well um, quite a bit here. And I would, if, if I could wave a wand, I would address that. And then I would start to pass the great legislation that I think um, we're putting forward in this administration that particularly impacts people. We have a lot of social issues we talk about we need to address, but right now people are scared, they're divided, they're angry. I think we need to start to address what we call here the kitchen table issues. Um, those things that, that really, as I put it, if you're a mom or dad, they're keeping you up at night. You can't fall asleep because you're so worried you can't pay the mortgage or your, your child's not mm -hmm. able to go to in-person school. All of those types of things we need to address. And I think that could help really bring the nation together. And finally, can I ask you, um, for you personally, showing showing leadership, what is the mo in, in politics, what's, what are the most important qualities or the manner in which you can do that? You know, I think it's constantly striving to put um, the needs of the country and the nation first. And that, that sounds, a, a, it sounds a little bit obvious. It sounds a little bit easy. But I think when you're often in a situation where you're trying to build coalitions and you're trying to determine how to best um, get something accomplished, um, and, and, you know, sometimes that overlaps with your uh, you know, your own self-interest and trying to always make sure you're, you're not doing something because it's good for you politically, but rather it's good for the country. And um, sometimes those things are the same, one and the same. And many times they're not. But I'll, I'll just say as, as somebody in elected office, I've noticed um, with the people I work with, if you make a habit of it, it becomes easier. If you make a habit of always acquiescing to the easiest path forward, that becomes the easiest path forward as well. Mm. You mean that you will, am I correct in understanding you there that you're saying you will gain a reputation then, or perhaps I'm misunderstanding you there for, for, um, for it's easy to get things past you? Or are you saying that maybe you just clarify that last point if you wouldn't mind? Sure. We, we as you see, and, and as you sort of alluded to and mentioned, um, we have a very partisan system right now. Mm. And there's a desire sometimes on both sides of the aisle from leadership for everyone to be in yeah. lockstep and voting against your own party or or talking about things that that might be against the party orthodoxy is almost seem, seen as, as, you know, a cardinal sin. But mm -hmm. in fact, I think if you're really thinking of the way forward in the country and bringing people together, you have to be open to some of the different ideas. You have to be open to negotiations. I have people in my party and, and the president is in the same political party who are mad at the president for even negotiating with Republicans. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's how our political system works. Uh, that's how we get stuff done. And, and there is this in this partisan atmosphere, there's almost this desire to to sort of not even engage. And yet I'll, I'll just finish quickly. It's not a zero sum game. We're all Americans. It's not as if, mm -hmm. if, if half of Americans lose half are winning. Uh, we do really need to come together as a country to address some of the systemic issues we have. Yeah. Got gotcha. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear, loud and clear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are going to go to some audience questions now after those excellent contributions from our, from our panelists. And th thank you all. Um, and uh, I see there is one here from um, uh, Larry Bass, actually. And Larry is wondering, do the panel agree we need to show political leadership by making plans? Larry's talking about long-term plans, talking about even 20 years ahead, not just with an eye to the next election. And I suppose that's what the Congresswoman was just talking about there. Should we look to a French-type list system? I might go to you, uh, Jim O'Callaghan, um, for your, your views on that. 
Yeah, thanks very much, um, Larry, for that question. Like, I think in fairness to the political system here, we do try to deal with issues on a long-term basis. For instance, we just uh, enacted the climate change bill. It's looking forward to what we can do in terms of reducing our emissions over the next 30 years or so. So that is something that is trying to take into account a long-term view. Uh, I also think we recognize that the housing crisis in this country that very really does exist, that the solutions to it are not going to be short-term and may not be seen uh, within the term of this government. But as I said in my introduction, if the public see a pathway and a change of policy that is going to re result in um, results, well, in that situation, I think they'll be supportive of it. In terms of the list system, like I, you, you may get more of the great and the good uh, elected to the Oireachtas if there was a list system. But I do think there is an advantage, notwithstanding the fact that it is extremely hard to get elected in Ireland, I do think there's an advantage that the public sort of can see the eyes of the people that they elect, mm -hmm. that they can decide to throw them out or put them in and they have full control over that. But certainly in, in terms of a reformed uh, Shannon, which is our upper house, I think we should be looking for something more imaginative and innovative so that we get people into Shannon Aaron who are elected mm -hmm. in a different way to the door. Yeah, I think you'd get a lot of agreement on that, uh, Jim. Uh, I see here that Patrick Lynch has said that uh, Congresswoman Cheryl has ma makes a good point about around the table issues. This is what leaders should be dealing with, addressing problems that people need starting out. So then Joshua Venable is saying, building on Alva's comments, political leadership involves more than just elected leaders. How can the public best engage when and if politicians fail to lead fail to lead to model encourage good good leadership so there you go alva what should the what should the public do if they feel that the politicians are, are letting them down well you know i think that the public do do something all the time um, when you look around the country look around the world people take matters into their own ha hands and i mean i've, I've obviously been very conscious at the moment that one of the key reasons why we need to have much more collaborative style of politics and coalitional politics that Mikey's been talking about and that and indeed others have mentioned is if you just think about the climate crisis, we're never going to resolve this with bipartisan and adversarial, adversarial political systems. And interestingly, this whole momentum for much more collaborative and coalitional ways of working does come from the ground up. And people do, when they get very annoyed and mad about something that's happening in their area, they you know, very typically form a group and start putting pressure. I'm involved at the moment in several things where we're putting pressure on uh, county councils, for, on local councils, for example, or writing to TDs um, in very often quite loose groups. But that is what people do. And I think that that is really important uh, political work and I, I, I think also that we need to have more respect for that but I can tell you that as somebody who's been an activist for a very 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 long time that is it's respected when you win but it's not respected generally and given that we don't win that often in a way you know it can be a very hard role for people to hold so I would like to see it built into our thinking about politics that that um, uh, people mobilization, motivation and momentum is a very crucial part of politics, that it's not some sort of annoyance for politicians. Okay, thank you, Alva. I'm, I'm curious to ask you, Alwyn, you mentioned in your contribution about the difficulty of being a political leader and maybe making a U-turn, even if you're making that U-turn for the right reasons. And that, and I've been there, I've been that journalist um, criticizing the U-turn. There's no better phrase or word for an intro than so-and-so committed a massive U-turn um, last night. How would you advise, or how would you do it yourself? You know, how's the best to put that in context? That it's not, sometimes you travel along a road, it, Larry Bass mentioned there, you know, you're projecting forward 20 years or if it's something that you've you've committed to for next week, but you've gathered more information and you've changed your mind. How do you present that, particularly in the current climate? Yeah, I think by being straightforward with people and being honest with people about it. And I think probably the best example is the most recent recent abortion referendum because people did travel a long road with that. Um, mm. And I think people changed their minds who really found it difficult and felt, you know, 
they find they realize that now they thought differently about it than they did 20 years ago and life can do that to you sometimes you know i'd often give the example of my own dad he'd say that maybe rather than all the years in politics changed his mind it was having four daughters and you know hearing what i think mikey said the kitchen table you know the conversations around the kitchen table can be very effective in changing politicians minds and that's why one of the good things about our system versus maybe the system in the states which is you know when you've only two it's obviously going to be more polarized but mm. that there is a broader a broader amount of voices there's a, a lot different shades of opinion and um, they may not all be elected but there's certain out there in society and are beginning beginning to find a voice. Okay, thank you. Mikey, there's a question here from Suzanne that I'm going to put to you if I may, and it says, it's asking the panel, I'll put it to yourself first anyway, does the panel believe that women are treated differently in political leadership roles than men? Are they held to a higher standard which then discourages others to get involved? That's such a, that's something I've thought about as you can imagine quite a mm. lot. I. Um, you know, I think we've seen that a lot in our political system and women always had to project toughness. And I think like in many roles, um, we needed a critical mass of women to start to see the, you know, how different, different individuals were and what they could bring to the table. But one of the things that helped, and, and we had a lot of women come into elected office in 2018, but one of the things that helped me as I was navigating that and allowed me to be a lot more authentic as I was running for office, talk about picking up my kids at soccer or something, mm. as opposed to having always to talk about how tough I was, um, was my background. I really relied heavily on my biography as a Navy helicopter pilot mm. and a federal prosecutor to show that I was tough. So I didn't have to always talk about how tough I was, because traditionally that's been very hard in our political system, um, because as you can imagine, um, people aren't electing me just because I flew a helicopter. People are also electing me because I have four kids and I know how hard it's been during coronavirus to teach them at home or attempt to teach them at home because I know what their, their needs are in office. And so if I'm just trying to tell you that I'm tough enough to do it, I'm not, I'm not coming across as somebody yeah. that you really want to elect. You're thinking that she's, you know, she doesn't really get my life. She's not like me. She's not somebody that's going to advocate well for me in office. So that has traditionally been a real struggle for women in our political system. Yeah, absolutely. I think I have to admit, though, I, I think I'd give you a vote for flying a Navy helicopter for, for that. <laughs> <laughs> I see here, David Hessian is saying it's easy to portray changing one's mind. This is going back to what we were discussing with Alvin as flip-flopping and weak. In reality, I think that having the courage to admit that I got something wrong is an incredible sign of strength as well as, as wisdom. Um, and uh, I, I would just like to push this, uh, this question to, uh, to Jim, if I may. It's from um, Midlife Women Rock Project. It's saying COVID highlighted the need for more women's voices around the decision-making table. Uh, Citizens' Assembly and social movements fill gaps. Uh, Alva, Alva demonstrated the power of such movements. Did you feel, Jim, that there was, did you uh, feel that uh, lack of, of, of female leadership or do you think it mattered? Yeah, I think it did matter. I think some crucial decisions were being made. Now people may recognize and accept that they had to be made, but there were extraordinary decisions being made uh, in respect of people's lives, the lives of every man, woman, and children and young person in the country. And you're right, at that stage, in terms of the top of the, National Public Health Advisory Team, there were very few women involved in making those decisions. I don't know if the decisions would have been different, Alison, but I think it would have communicated, I suppose, a different message to the uh, public at large had women been uh, involved in it. And I know from speaking to women in my constituency that some of them, not all of them, but some of them felt excluded by it. I suppose part of the problem was as well, when we go back to look at the pandemic, like I think we, we did make a, a mistake and it was a justifiable and understandable mistake, but we allowed there to be two separate sources of authority emanating from the state at the beginning of it. One from the government, the other from NEFET. And at times they conflicted and people saw them as being different. And I think that's a lesson that we have to learn from the pandemic. And I think the, the fact that NEFET was so dominated by men probably um, made it more difficult for them. Mm. Was that some, Alv, I see you nodding there. Uh, was, it, was it something that, that bothered you that you felt acutely? 
Well, I, you know, I, I wasn't the only person bothered by it. I think half the women in the country were very annoyed as as the, the, the situation grew worse and more difficult and there was more distress and pain and suffering in the country. And it looked as if, uh, as, not just women, right across the board, we just didn't have a look in or a speak in at all. And I think that, you know, I, I think this was very unfortunate. Um, and particularly when I remember one occasion which someone tweeted on where you had three or four men talking about something and behind in the background you had women holding notebooks i mean that was a very very poor image what price equality and what price an equal democracy in an ireland where when the chips were down the only people who were seen you know however subconsciously as capable of, of resolving the problem were men so there is a huge huge gap and a big step forward that has to be taken now and i would just add one thing to you know really appreciate what mikey was uh, was saying there um, but i think it's also really important for girls and for women to see that it's okay for us to be tough it's okay for us to be tough and it is very okay for men to say i've got to go collect the kids or I've got to stay at home for homeschooling, or I have domestic responsibilities, we can't have uh, do the Doyle sitting at midnight, or whatever it is. And I think we need much more of that balance. But a bit more toughness for girls, I think, is pretty important. I had to, <laughs> this will surprise you, I had to teach myself to be tough. But I did, because actually, politics and the political and social movements, they are tough. You have to be able to fight for your ideals and your beliefs and you have to be able to and bring people with you. What Alwyn said is so right. You have to draw people out and bring those people who haven't been speaking and make them be tough enough to get up there and speak as well. So big step forward for Irish politics now post-COVID, I'm saying, and I'm thinking, and we've got a good report from the Citizens Assembly on gender to give us a bit of a leg up there. Indeed. Uh, and yet, I suppose, Mikey, I don't know whether you're familiar with this, that the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, had an episode recently in Turkey where there wasn't a seat put out for her along with the uh, the, the two men yet. And I, I found it really powerful when she stood in the European Parliament a few weeks later and said that she had been hurt, among many other things that she said, that she had been hurt by that. I actually thought there was real, real power, power in that as well. I see here that Ivana Craig is making the comment that certainly opening pubs, this is again is to do with COVID and the decisions that, that were made around the pandemic, opening pubs and, and sports before allowing partners into maternity hospitals shows the lack of a female or feminist perspective. This was just to explain to Mikey, this has been an ongoing issue here um, where uh, partners are only allowed in um, for a very limited period to, to maternity hospitals, which has caused a lot of... Uh, a lot of distress. Mikey, I'm going to, we're going to be close to, to wrapping up now, but I suppose I'm interested in, in um, asking you in terms of um, leadership in the, in the US and where you, it's been a, it's been a short period of time um, since uh, you changed president and you now have, have President Biden. Um, can you, f this, so a change of leadership, um, do you feel it on the ground? Do you feel any change he's taken, President Biden has taken a pretty different approach to, to leadership and how he says things and, you know, how decisions are made? Is there any sense of the, the atmosphere tempering a little bit? So there is, uh, the atmosphere is tempering. And I, I think I'm probably not the exact right person to talk about this. And I'll tell you why, because before um, we have three branches of government, the executive, the legislative and the judiciary. And um, before most of um, the Trump's policies, and I would call kind of craziness, was in the executive branch. Mm -hmm. Now, the executive branch feels quite calm. Um, you know, President Biden is, is overseas now, actually for you guys, uh, in your neck of the woods, um, to really try to reassert our partnerships and alliances in, in a way that um, I think feels much more traditional of the United States. That feels very, very good to many of us. Um, unfortunately for me personally, many of the people who ran along a sort of Trump-like platform are now in the House uh, of representatives that I serve with. So it still feels quite crazy. And I think people still see some of that coming through. And um, 
there's a very odd thing that seems to happen with a, a president like President Trump, where people almost become addicted to the drama. Yeah. And, um, and and the the people in elected office in the House kind of recreate that drama. And it's almost like we're weaning ourselves off of that and trying to really focus on getting back to um, governing and legislating. And, and as I talk to people throughout the district, um, there's this mix, there's really mixed emotions, sort of cautious hope for the future, but also a, a continued dread over what they're hearing coming from, from continuing to come from elected officials and, and the impact that, that the former President Trump still seems to have on um, large parts of the country. Okay, thank you, Mikey. And I'm going to to finish this with two comments, one from Patrick Lynch, who's saying an excellent panel, very focused and honest answers. And James Birchall has saying, this has been an excellent session. Thanks to all the speakers and thanking me, but modesty prevents me from going into any further detail on that. <laughs> so look, I'd really like very much and very sincerely like to thank um, Jim, Alwyn, Alva, and, and Mikey. It's been a really interesting session and thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much. So I'm going to move on now to Professor Neve Brennan, who's been listening uh, in, in the background in the green room. And I'm going to ask Neve, Neve, can you give us your initial reaction? Was there anything that stood out for you? Um, anything that you'd, you'd take away from that, uh, from that discussion? Um, thanks, Alison. A few things uh, that I'd like to take away. Um, first of all, it was an absolutely brilliant discussion, really a fantastic discussion. So the things I picked out was, you know, politics is a very adversarial system. Politics is complicated. Alwyn then talked about the importance of the ability to compromise. She mm -hmm. also talked about gambling with success. And she uh, name called John Hume, David Trimble, Eamon Ginmore in that sense. I liked the question from a participant urging politicians to be kinder to each other. Um, I, I thought that was really nice. Um, I liked Alva, you know, highlighting that, you know, elected representatives are not the only people setting the agenda. I also love her expression that the monochrome nature of politics at present. So some people don't have a voice. Um, the discussion about compromise was picked up again by Congressman Cheryl um, when she was talking to us about the need to be bipartisan in the US and not as polarized as they cur uh, currently are, highlighting the importance of the kitchen table issues, things that are keeping ordinary voters awake at night. Um, she uh, resonated with Jim O'Callaghan's commentary when she said, put the nation first is political leadership. Jim's fifth characteristic was to take a national perspective. Congressman Cheryl also mentioned authenticity. I really liked that, that she puts her authenticity out there. Um, and then um, I, I, it also resonated with me when she commented about some people in the US being addicted to the drama of the Trump years um, and that we have to get back governing. So loved the debate and thanks very much for it. Neve, thank you very much for that. Um, I am going to uh, say farewell now before I, and uh, thanks to all of today's speakers and for making it so interesting. And I'm going to hand you back over to Joanne Hessian. Alison, thank you so much. That brings us almost to the Thank you so much, Alison. That brings us almost to the end of a really incredible event today. We really packed in a lot in that hour. So thank you to everybody involved. What I take from this contribution is that politics is totally perfect. It might suggest that it's a profession that could be difficult to navigate. But for my part, however, I've always thought that while the demands placed on politicians must be really complex and immense, regardless of the situation, there's only one principle that allows an individual to be at peace with themselves. And for me, that's to do the right thing. Re-election doesn't matter. The individual politician doesn't matter. All that matters are honesty, integrity, and consistency. And in this, I'm thinking of the Roman statesman Marcus Cicero, who 2000 years ago said, I've always been of the opinion that unpopularity earned by doing what is right 
is not unpopularity at all, but it's glory. And our society deserves to know that regardless of the pressures, regardless of the demands of lobby groups and constituents, and regardless of the possibility that immediate popularity might suffer, those with political power will exercise that power only to do the right thing. I think there were great discussions about all of that today. The good news is, is that Lift Ireland uh, has 17,000, over 17,000 people now on board and working, putting their hands up and saying better is possible and I want to be part of that. Uh, Lift is a process to build our leadership character. And again, your classroom table, at your, at your kitchen table, your classroom, in a clubhouse, in the door, or in a boardroom. This stuff is really Thank you so much to our and to Neve Brennan, the rapper. Before before we finish, we'd really like to leave you with the launch of a new two minute video about Lyft from Ireland's young leaders. Pay attention. This two minutes has our wonderful, wonderful leaders in Ireland that are just very young and it is well worth a watch. If you're not yet involved in Lift Ireland, building stronger leadership across the nation, you should be asking yourself, well, why am I not? The change starts with me. Thank you. At Lift Ireland, we're creating a nation of positive and ethical leaders, from the kitchen table to the classroom, the clubhouse to the boardroom, one person at a time. Almost 20,000 people have participated in the Lift process. The energy and impact are high. Here are just some of the testimonials from CEOs, students and non-profits, read by Ireland's future leaders. I'm now taking more responsibility for my actions and owning up to my mistakes. I now know it started with me. I've become much more aware of honesty, respect and empathy and how they help us to connect better with people. I think the one thing that was most valuable to me was me realizing that we are all leaders and there is always room for improvement. I now live a life that is truly my own. I see the potential in myself. Lift has helped me with my accountabilities and my personal values. Sometimes failure offers more growth than winning. Lift has beyond exceeded in my expectations. My behavior and decisions have been improved tenfold since taking part in Lyft. Lyft is for everyone in the company, from new starts to senior management. I have found that this helps to build a culture of equality. And in turn, there's better communication and work relationships. Lyft has helped me to stop and think about how to deal with others and I will now listen to people better. Lift is a reminder of the importance of self-reflection. Life experience and a positive attitude. I now approach things with an open mind, positive attitude and I'm more confident in myself. <laughs> No matter who you are, if your words and actions influence anyone, you are a leader, and that's you. Be the best leader you can be. Join Lift Ireland to strengthen your leadership muscle. Lift yourself, lift others, and together, let's lift Ireland.